um, the thing that um, uh, most of you should know is there there's my email address and we'll have these conversations for the next five weeks or so but almost invariably the thing that will happen is you're going to wake up at five in the morning or three in the morning and be like oh my gosh I wonder and your spouse is like shut up go back to sleep leave me alone and, and you'll need to know and so just send me email and I'll get back to you and we'll answer your questions wherever you see me around I see a lot of you on the floor you can always stop me and ask me questions but the point is is that you may not always have the question right here while we're sitting here so don't think this is your only opportunity um, to, to, to get the answers to questions you have so certainly um, just send me email and we can get together and chat if it's too complicated to explain on email or I'll send you an answer and we can go back and forth which is what I usually do with folks okay um, you can follow me on Twitter um, and so uh, I post a lot of stuff there. I post a lot of blogs that I do there as well, so you can always get extra information if you want that. Okay, so um, one of the reasons that this particular talk that we're having is of interest is because this year uh, astronomers and physicists and gravitational scientists around the world are celebrating the 100th anniversary of general relativity. So general relativity is the modern description of gravity that Einstein first wrote down 100 years ago, and it has, over the past 100 years, been a subject of much study and consternation and confusion. <laughs> but now, 100 years later, it's kind of central to almost everything we do in astronomy. And so it's really important for things like quasars, galaxies, and cosmology, which we'll spend some time talking about over the next few weeks. Uh, if you look at the topic list that you guys submitted, those kinds of things fall in there. So we're going to spend more than our fair share of time talking about relativity and, and the ways that it's important. Um, today, obviously, uh, we're going to talk about black holes, and relativity plays a very big role in the story of black holes, so we'll talk about that. Um, and probably something that a lot of us don't know, but this is something that we uh, talk about a lot, is that in your everyday life, general relativity plays an important role because you cannot have a GPS that operates correctly that will get you from here to the ice cream store unless there's general relativity built into your phone. Okay? It's absolutely essential to making GPS technology work. And we're not going to talk about it today, but we can talk about it sometime if you guys want to. But uh, this is a big, big part that relativity plays. But the important thing about that is that this is 100 years ago that we figured this out, but it's only now, 100 years later, that we actually know how to use it right. And so one of the funny things that you see happening when people talk about you know, science and science research and what we do with science is they're like, well, what can I do with it? It's like, well, we don't know what you can do with it. It's going to take us 100 years to figure out why whatever science we're doing today is important. And this is a classic example. Einstein never would have imagined that you would have a magic device in your pocket that can get you from point A to point B. But 100 years later, we have that. So, so anyway, so relativity, this is our centennial, and so you'll see lots of things going on. Back there on that previous page, you saw that, uh, that hashtag. Those of you who are on social media, you'll see GR100 and GR centennial hashtags, and if you follow those, you'll find all the things about uh, relativity going on. Okay, so let's, what are we going to do today? So um, this is the, the website uh, where I put all the slides and all the links to everything that we do. So CWC, that's uh, Conversations with the Cosmos, ScienceJedi.com, that's me. Um, if you go there, the slides from the last time we did this are still there. Uh, and as I make the slides for this, uh, for this class, then we'll put them there as well. So it'll be, kind of be this ongoing library of things that you can go back to and look at and, and see if it's helpful. Um, I'll put the audio recordings and the links to the YouTubes there as well for you. Um, if you go to the slides there, there's two sets of slides, one that's called small and one that's normal. Normal are the ones that you see here. The small ones are reduced in file size, so the images aren't quite as great, but it's easier to load on your phone when you're sitting on the train or something like that. So, so the small ones are, are for mobile devices, really, but the, the full-size ones will have all the pretty pictures. Most important thing as we do all this is for you guys to ask questions. If you got them, ask them. Um, if we know the answers, we'll tell you. If it takes us time to figure out, we'll tell you that too. And but the important thing is, that if you have the questions, you got to ask them. Otherwise, you know, there's no point in doing this, right? You can go read as easily as you can uh, 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 sit here. Uh, but if you have questions, that's really what I'm here for is to kind of help ask them. So today, um, we'll talk a little bit about escaping gravity, what we mean about the strength of gravity, and, and those sorts of things. We'll talk about what that means for black holes. Okay. And then we'll talk about seeing black holes. So there's all kinds of things we can talk about black holes. Probably we could fill a whole 10 weeks about this if we just wanted to talk about black holes. But uh, today we're going to focus on astrophysics of black holes because that's probably the thing that's most relevant to the kinds of things that we encounter 
um, when we're up in the museum and when people are asking you questions at flag day dinner or whatever uh, when your family's over. So, okay? Does that sound okay? Okay. So when I do this talk, either for the public or with my students, the very first thing I do is I uh, go through an exercise with you where we talk about what you know about or what you've heard about or questions you have about black holes. So why don't we do some things here? Let's complete this list. So I'll start. Uh, things that I know about black holes, things that you've heard. Uh, black holes mess things up, right? <laughs> okay, what else? What else do you guys know about black holes? What have you heard about black holes? They're what? Powerful. Powerful. Okay, what else? They're tunnels to other universes. You guys heard that? Um, what else? Oh, they change time. Okay, what else? They're messy eaters. That's true. We'll talk about that today. Okay. What else do you know about black holes? Or something you want to know about black holes that you don't know? Okay. So they're created by dying stars. Okay. We won't talk about that today, but we'll probably talk about that maybe next time, maybe the time after. Okay. That's true. Are they always in the middle? Okay. Galaxies, for instance. Yes, that's true. We'll talk about that today. What else do you guys think? Ah, the mass is changing. Yeah, that's true. Mass, that's, I can't see what I'm typing because it's only over that screen. How about we go, does the mass change? Okay, anything else? You guys heard that they evaporate over time? Okay, that's something that we call Hawking radiation. You may have heard Stephen Hawking. Anything else? So this is the kind of thing that, uh, that, you know, most of us have heard about black holes. We've seen, read things about black holes. We've seen documentaries about black holes. We've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about black holes. There's all kinds of things that black holes have kind of worked their way into our, into our minds, into our culture, into our stories, into our science fiction, right? If you watch the X-Files, I'm sure there's some episode of the X-Files where a black hole was at the heart of everything, right? Interstellar, the whole story of Interstellar is all about the black hole. How many of you have seen the black hole, the old Disney movie? Oh, you've never seen that? Oh, we got to have a movie night. Okay, right? 1980, black hole, the black hole. It's got crazy robots and mad scientists and everything. It's awesome, okay? Um, but anyways, but it's kind of worked its way into our culture. There's almost none of us who haven't not heard about the word of black holes, okay? But as scientists, these are not just things that we tell stories about. They're things that today we actually feel like we understand. There are things that we know what they do to the universe around them. And so we look out to the cosmos and we see things that obviously we think uh, are black holes. And so what I want to talk about today is what do we see? What do we mean when we say this word and how it is that we can study them? Okay. Okay. So this is the beginning of everything. So one of the coolest things about the world is that nature has very predictable ways that it behaves. Right? So you look at a picture like this, and the rain falls because when the warm air passes over the lake, the air over the lake is cool, and when air gets cold, it lets go of all the moisture in it, and it creates rain. Okay? When the rain falls and the light passes through it, the water drops reflect the light in such a way that it creates something like a rainbow. The waves on the lake are driven by the wind, and as they go to shallower water, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? All of these things are predictable ways that nature behaves. If I go to any lake in the country besides Lake Michigan and I watch for rainstorms, I'll see all of these same behaviors. Nature is predictable. We can figure things out. And so when we talk about figuring things out, we call those things the laws of nature. They're the rules that we as scientists use to look at the world around us and say, what do I see happening? Why is it happening? And can I predict what's going to happen 10 minutes from now? 
if you have some rule about the way nature works and you can't do those things, in particular if you can't explain what's going on and say what things are going to be like five minutes from now, then your law of nature is not really the right law of nature. And so what we spend all of our time doing as astronomers and physicists and chemists and biologists is trying to figure out what the right laws of nature are. The things that allow us to explain what we see going on around us. The things that allow us to predict the way the world behaves. And so in astronomy, in astrophysics in particular, one of the biggest laws of nature that we care about is gravity. So let's talk about gravity. So our first understanding of gravity really started here with Isaac Newton. Uh, Newton did a tremendous number of things. Uh, in particular, he, uh, you can just see the back end of it right there. Right? He invented something called the Newtonian reflector, which is far and away the most common kind of telescope that you and I encounter in our everyday lives. Uh, he worked in light, in optics, uh, but the thing that he really did was he thought a lot about motion and in particular about gravity. And in 1687, he published a book called the Principia. It has a big, long Latin name, which means the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. But we all just call it the Principia, which is just the middle part, the principles, right? But it is arguably the most famous book in the history of science. It really laid the foundation for the way that we approach science today, the way we think about the universe around us. This idea that there are laws of nature you can write down, that you can use those to predict the future. And Newton's really one of the very first per people to codify that and write it down in this kind of really robust and extensive way so that the rest of us could read the book and go, oh, that makes sense. Let's, let's think about the world that way. Okay? And in the Principia, there were kind of three major things that he did. Okay, so the first thing he did was he wrote down the laws of motion. Okay, now, how many of you are physicists? Okay, only Steve, okay, and me, okay. But all of you know what the laws of motion are. You just don't know it. Okay, so I'm going to say the laws of motion and you're going to help me finish. Okay, okay, an object in motion stays in motion. An object at rest stays at rest, okay. Unless acted on by an outside force. You even know the rest of it. Okay, time for you to go to graduate school. Okay, so... That's called the first law of motion. It's the idea that things move because other things influence them. Okay? The second law of motion is, is the description of if I apply a force to an object, how much does it change its motion? Okay, so that's usually called the acceleration law or Newton's second law. Okay? And the third one you all know as well, which is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay? And so that's about how when I come over and I push on your hand, your hand's pushing back on me. That's why you don't just fall over when I push on you, and that's why I don't fall over trying to push on you, okay? So that's called Newton's third law. So the laws of motion, those three things were first written down in the Principia, okay? The second thing that he wrote down is what we call the universal law of gravitation. And this is the way gravity has really been thought about for the last 300 years. It's perfectly good for doing all kinds of ordinary everyday things. So in particular, if you and I want to do the astronaut farmer thing and go in my backyard and build a rocket and fly to the moon, we would use the universal law of gravitation. How many of you have seen the astronaut farmer? <sighs> okay. Clearly we need to just have a class about movies, right? Okay, so that's also a great movie. Billy Bob Thornton flies to the moon from his backyard. You should totally watch that. Okay, okay. but the universal law of gravity, it's still used today to fly satellites, to send Mars probes, to send probes to Saturn, to send New Horizons to Pluto. We use the universal law of gravitation. Okay. The last thing that's in the Principia is something that, much to all of our demise, Newton decided he had to have. He wrote down all of this stuff and he found out that it wasn't just good enough to write down the laws of nature. He had to have a way to use them, a way to manipulate them. And so he also figured out what we call calculus. And so the Principia, in addition to the laws of motion, universal law has calculus in it. Because Newton found that he couldn't solve all the problems he was interested in without also developing this mathematical framework to use the laws within. Now if you have friends who are mathematician nerds, how many of you are mathematicians? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, you're a physicist, Steve, right? Yeah, okay. So, so mathematicians will tell you that calculus was invented by a guy named Leibniz. And so there's this whole, was it Newton, was it Leibniz? And it seems clear that they both kind of invented it. They wrote it down in slightly different ways, but depending on who you talk to, people will tell you Newton did it, or people will tell you Leibniz did it. I'm a physicist, so clearly Newton did it, right? Okay. Okay? So, no, that's right. <laughs> no. Okay, so all of 
this is in the Principia. And this was the beginning, right? It's kind of interesting that, you know, gravity played the central role in the development of this. This is what Newton was really thinking about when he started going down this pathway. The famous story, right? He was sick. Um, he was at his mother's farm in Lincolnshire, and he was taking a stroll in the garden, and he saw an apple fall from a tree. Although normally you see pictures of it savagely attacking him and jumping on his head, right? But he saw the apple fall, and he had been thinking about the moon and trying to understand why the moon didn't just go careening off through space, why it just stay close to the Earth. And he decided it stayed close to the Earth for the same reason the apple was trying to stay close to the Earth, this thing called gravity. And that's what set him off down the path to thinking about this. And now, 300 years later, we send astronauts to the Moon Museum, which is kind of cool. Okay? So, that's the beginning. But 100 years ago, this gentleman showed up. Okay? So this is Albert Einstein. This is when Einstein was a very young man. Uh, he was, uh, right after he got out of university, he really wanted a job being a physics professor, and he couldn't find a job as a physics professor. But he had a friend whose dad worked at the patent office in Bern, and so he got a job reviewing patents uh, at the Bern patent office. Okay, and so this is, this is apparently called the patent office suit, which I didn't know. So this is the uniform if you work in the patent office. What color do you think that is? gray, brown, right? Apparently they're green. So apparently the patent office suit is green, I just found out. So I totally want a green tweed jacket now so I can totally look like Al, right? Okay. So obviously they paid him quite well. This is back when he could afford combs to comb his hair. Um, so he was working in the patent office and in those days, right, he would come home in the evening. They didn't have TV. They don't even, I don't even think they had radio then, right? The Marconi experiments were just a few years before. And so what do you do in the evenings, right? Well, so Einstein worked on physics because that was fun. So in the evenings, he worked on physics. And in 1905, he published three of the most important papers in physics. Really, they're the papers that laid the foundation for a lot of the technology that you and I see around us today. And so physicists usually call 1905 the miracle year because those three papers showed up. Okay, and we won't talk about all of them. The only one that we care about today is this one. Okay, so there was a paper about something called special relativity. Okay, so you guys have probably all also heard about special relativity. What do you know about special relativity? <laughs> it also messes things up, right? So crazy things happen in relativity. What kinds of crazy things do you, do you know? So if I travel really, really fast, close to the speed of light, what happens to my clock, my time? Yeah, it changes for me, right? And what happens to the lengths of objects that I see? They, they look shorter. They look distorted, right? Okay. So there's all kinds of crazy things that come about with special relativity, but it all derives from this one thing. This is Einstein's most brilliant insight that he ever had, which was that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Now, up to that time, no one had ever thought there was an ultimate speed limit. Okay, we knew the speed of light fast. In fact, we could measure the speed of light, right? So the speed of light had a long history of being measured, right? So Galileo started this. You guys know how Galileo did the speed of light measurement? You guys know this story? Okay, so Galileo got one of his friends. And he said, okay, I'm going to have a lantern, and you're going to have a lantern, and you're going to go stand over on that hill three miles away, and when you see me uncover my lantern, the light's going to travel all the way to you, and when you see it, you're going to uncover your lantern, the light's going to travel back to me, and I'm going to time how long that takes to go. Okay? So, I, you know, Galileo goes like this, the light goes out, his partner goes in, comes back, okay? What answer did they get? Do you know? Fast. Okay? So fast that he couldn't actually measure how fast it's going. Okay? And we know that, right? The, the moon is about a second away at the speed of light. So measuring it with lanterns and your pals on, on hillsides is never going to work, okay? But uh, astronomers had figured it out. We can measure the speed of light by timing how long it takes the moons of Jupiter to go into eclipse. That was developed by a Dutch uh, astronomer named Romer. Uh, but we knew it was fast, but we had never suspected you couldn't go faster. And Einstein was the first person to figure that out, okay? And there's, there's a variety of reasons why he thought that. And we can talk about that sometime. But, but this, is, this is the crucial step. And the important thing, the thing that's germane to our story today, is that that means gravity itself can't travel faster than the speed of light. Because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. My rockets can't. I can't. Different colors of light can't. Gravity can't. Baseballs I throw can't. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But if you go back to the way Newton described gravity, gravity could. 
And so that's what made Einstein start thinking about gravity, is he knew that Newton's description of gravity let gravity travel instantaneously. If I were to remove the sun from the solar system in Newtonian gravity, the Earth would instantly know about it and go traveling off through the galaxy. But Einstein knew that you can't do that. If I could magically make the sun disappear, it should take eight minutes before the Earth decides the sun's not there anymore. Okay, so this is what set Einstein down on the path of thinking about general relativity. Okay, okay, so let's talk about gravity. So you guys experience gravity every day, right? It's what's holding you in each of your chairs. Okay, so on Earth, we call that gravity that you feel 1G. Okay, and so it's, we usually write it with a little g, but when you spell it out, you spell it G E E, like the Bee Gees, right? Okay, so. 1G is what you feel sitting here on the Earth. Now, how do I make gravity stronger? How do I make it bigger? I can do one of two things. I can, I can make the object smaller, which will make the gravity stronger, or I can put more stuff. Okay, so the sun has more stuff than the Earth, about a million times more. Okay, so if you were sitting on the surface of the sun, You'd need an astronaut suit like, like Yola has there, right? So you don't burn up, right? Okay. If you were sitting on the surface of the sun, you wouldn't experience 1G. You would experience 27 Gs. Okay? So that would be like if all of us dogpiled on top of Steve, right? Then Steve would feel much more force pressing down on him, not just the 1G of the Earth pulling down. And so that's what you would feel if you were on the surface of the sun. You'd feel gravity pulling on you so much stronger than you are now. You wouldn't be able to stand up. You wouldn't be able to breathe. You'd be like, I'm just going to lay in bed all day, right? Okay. But there are objects in the universe that have far stronger gravity than even the sun. And so the question that we want to ask, the thing that we want to use to develop our conversation about black holes is this. How fast do I have to travel to get away from an object? That has strong gravity. Okay, so we have a name for that. Do you guys know what we call that? The escape speed. Okay, and so this is what NASA worries about every single time they have to build a rocket, is how fast we have to make that rocket go so it can get away from the Earth. Okay, so on the Earth, you have to go 11 kilometers per second to get away. So that's like going from the Adler to Midway Airport in one second. Okay, what about the Sun? We just said the Sun had 27 times the gravity of the Earth at the surface. How fast do you have to go to get away from the sun? Okay. 618 kilometers per second. So that's like going from the Adler to Pittsburgh in one second. Okay. Nothing we've ever built goes that fast. If we built a rocket on the surface of the sun, we wouldn't be able to get away from the sun because we've never built a rocket that can do that. Voyager is the fastest spaceship ever built by humans. But we had to use the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn to wing it out so it could even just get away from the sun to go out into the solar system. Okay. But if we were sitting on the surface, we'd never be able to do it. And there's all kinds of awesome movies about landing on the surface of the sun that you all should watch too, but we'll take care of that later. Okay. Now, we said there were two ways to make things the gravity really strong. One was to put more stuff in it, right? So that's why the sun's gravity is so strong. But the other thing we could do is you can make it smaller. When you take an object and you shrink it down, its gravity gets really, really, really strong. And there are objects in the universe that have the mass of the sun, but they're the size of the Earth. You know what we call those? No, nope, not black holes. Almost. Neutron stars. Okay, so neutron stars are even smaller than that. These are something you get to before neutron stars. These are called white dwarfs. Okay, but neutron stars are, are shrunk down to the size of a city. Same thing, just shrunk down to the size of the sea, and their gravity is even stronger. Okay, I'm going to skip over neutron stars, but we'll talk about them next week or the week after. Okay, but that's called a white dwarf. So you, the star like the sun, when it dies, it will shrink down to the size of the earth. This thing, this white dwarf, is a gigantic carbon crystal. What's carbon crystal? Diamond. <laughs> okay, these are gigantic solar mass diamonds in the sky. Okay. The escape speed from the surface of a white dwarf is 6,450 kilometers per second. That's like going from the Adler to London in a second. Okay. But 
if I want to make a black hole, I want to take the sun, take something the size of a white dwarf, and shrink it down to just six kilometers across. You could put two of them between us and Midway. They're tiny. Okay? And if you shrink them down to that small, then the escape speed is the speed of light. Okay? The gravity is getting steadily stronger as you go this way. Okay? So the sun's gravity is 27 times the gravity of the Earth. The white dwarf's gravity is a million times the gravity of the Earth. The gravity of the black hole is a million trillion times stronger than the gravity at the surface of the Earth for a solar mass black hole. Okay? And you see the speed that you need to go getting steadily stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay? So, this is the story. These are the objects that we want to talk about. We want to talk about those objects who have gravity so strong that their escape speed is the speed of light. Okay? Everyone good with that? Okay. So this will be our operational definition. Okay? So, who thought of this? Where did this stuff come from? Herschel? Oh, actually, I don't know if Herschel ever thought about black holes. That's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't Herschel. Herschel didn't start that story, right? The person that I'm thinking of did start that story. Not Ch Well, no, Chandra. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Ch so Chandra Sekhar was a Chicagoan. He was at the University of Chicago. Um, and he wrote this mammoth book. So Chandrasekhar had this very interesting habit. He's like, I'm interested in black holes. So he studies it for 10 years, figures out everything, writes down a big fat book, and then he's like, okay, I'm done with that. I'm going to go think about relativistic stars. And he thinks about it for 10 years, writes a big fat book. But Chandrasekhar did think about black holes. But this is far, far earlier. Okay. So the person who's the very first person we know of to think about this is a guy named the Reverend John Mitchell in 1783. Okay. So this is not too long after the publication of the Principia, and already people were trying to understand that there are objects who have escape speeds that are the speed of light. They knew the speed of light was fast. They didn't know how fast. They didn't know that you couldn't go faster than the speed of light. But they were thinking about what an object would be like. Okay? Now, I have a silhouette of Mitchell here because no picture of Mitchell exists. Okay? But there is a description of Mitchell that says he was short, fat, and beady-eyed. So if you go Google short, fat, and beady-eyed, then you get you know things that look like this. But uh, but there's no picture of him, right? So he was a genius as as much as Newton. He went to Cambridge. He was widely regarded. He worked on all kinds of different things. But no picture of him apparently exists at all. Okay. But the person that most of us associate our understanding of black holes with, or the idea that black holes came from, is Einstein. Okay, but this is 200 years before Einstein was even born. So what is it that Einstein added to the black hole story that makes us think his name should be associated with this? Well, space-time, that's one part of it, okay? So that's another part. But there's, there's one kind of central issue that isn't included in this here, okay? And that's that you can't go faster than the speed of light. Einstein added to this story that you couldn't get away. Before the advent of relativity, people thought about this and like, sure, someday I'll just build a big gigantic rocket and I'll be able to get away. But Einstein added, if you go in, you ain't getting back out again. And that was new, completely new. And that's why black holes have this kind of crazy mystique in our brains. Because this is the only instance we've ever encountered in physics, where there's a place in the cosmos where you can go and never be heard from again. It's walled off from us. Nothing that happens, it's like Vegas, right? Nothing that happens in a black hole ever gets out. It all stays in there. Okay? And that never even occurred to physicists before. But all it took was Einstein saying, yeah, that's a great idea that Mitchell had. You're never getting back out again. And that kind of freaked people out. Okay? So we had to spend a century thinking about what are the implications of that? What does it mean? And we still don't know all the implications. We still don't know all the things that are going on. But we know enough that we've looked out into the universe and we've seen things. We can explain them in no other way other than there are these crazy objects called black holes. There are these domains in the universe that are locked away 
that you can never see inside. Okay? So let's talk about those things. Okay. So, you all know Michelle, right? So I'm like, Michelle, got to show him a picture of a black hole. She's like, no problem. I can handle that. I got a picture of a black hole for you. <laughs> hey, what are you laughing for? She was very proud of this picture. She insisted that she get credit for it. Okay? So, why is this picture serious? That's what they look like, right? Almost everything that you know about the universe, we've discovered with a telescope. When you go open an astronomy textbook, or you pick up the Chicago Tribune in the morning, and they got the latest Hubble picture, the latest pictures from Ceres, or the latest pictures from the, the Pluto probe, right? All of those pictures are taken with telescopes. Telescopes gather light and make pictures that our eyes can see. But we said the whole point with a black hole is that they light can't get away from them. So that one probe that we use to think about the universe, to understand what the universe is telling us, won't work with these things because they don't give off any of that kind of radiation. They don't give off light. So how can it be that we can learn about what they are and why they're important in the universe if I can't even see them? Okay, well, that's what the game's always been about. If we can't see them, what we have to look is what they do to everything else around them. Right? So, we're going to go out into the cosmos, we're going to look for things that do shine, and we're going to look for evidence that they're under the influence of an extremely strong gravitational force that presumably emanates from something like a black hole. Now, that's not the whole game, right? Every time you see something going on, you got to say, okay, what could it be? You know, it could be a black hole, it could be a neutron star, it could be Steve tricking me, right? Okay? You got to rule out all those possibilities. It's the whole Sherlock Holmes things, right? When you rule out everything that's possible, whatever's left, no matter how improbable, has to be the truth. And all the things that I'm going to show you are examples where we as astronomers have gone through that process and gotten down to the point where there's no way to explain what we're seeing other than it's a black hole. Okay? Which is cool. So, how many of you have been out and seen the Summer Triangle and done that kind of stargazing? Any of you? A few of you? Okay, so Summer Triangle right now is coming up about 2 in the morning or so. It'll be up high enough for you to see. By late summer, it'll be overhead, and you can just go out when it first gets dark and see it. You may not be able to see all of the stars that I show you here from Chicago, but if you kind of go out to the suburbs or out into the country, you know, head down to the sand dunes or something, you'll be able to see... Uh, the uh, night sky, and so there's th uh, three bright stars that we call the Summer Triangle. They're the brightest stars in the constellation Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila. Aquila is the eagle. It kind of stretches off the bottom of the map here. And right in the middle of the Summer Triangle, this is the Milky Way going diagonally down through the picture here. The constellation Cygnus, this is the swan. Here's the head of the swan. Here's his wings and his tails, okay? Right in the middle, there's the next star. That's called Eta Cygni. Here's a blow-up of that region. Okay, so there's Eta Cygni. If you look through your telescope, there will be this little chain of stars that you can follow to this star right here. Okay, and that star, which you can see in the telescope from your backyard, is a blue supergiant star. It just looks like a star when you look at it in your telescope. But in the 1960s, the very first telescope that we flew that was capable of detecting X-rays, which is light that your eyeball can't see, but it's extremely energetic, we saw a huge number of x-rays coming from that star. And so the question is, what's causing it, right? Through the telescope, it just looks like an ordinary star. But astronomers knew there were enormous amounts of x-rays coming from it, so they started studying the star intensely. And so what they discovered is, over the course of about six days, this star wobbles back and forth. And so you say, okay, you got a star, something bigger than the sun wobbling back and forth every six days. What can cause that? Well, we know the law of gravity. We can use it to predict the future. We can use it to figure things out. And so you figure out, what does it take to make a star like this wobble back and forth? And it takes something that's about 15 times the mass of the sun. But we don't see it in our telescope. All we see is this star. Okay. So what's going on? Well, we have lots and lots of x-rays, and we have a thing wobbling back and forth. So it has to be something with powerful gravity, 
that you can't see in the telescope. Doesn't emit any light, right? But it somehow generates all of these x-rays. Well, the answer is it's a black hole. Okay, and what's going on is this star has a stellar wind. That's what stars do, the solar wind, the sun blows particles off. And the intense gravity of the unseen companion pulls all of that material in the stellar wind down towards the unseen object. And when gas falls down together, it travels really, really fast. And when gas is traveling really, really fast, all the little gas particles collide with each other. And when they collide with each other, gas gets hot. And when gas gets hot, it puts off light. And the hotter it gets, the more energetic the light. And x-rays are super energetic. So, every piece of evidence that we see points to the idea that this thing must be a black hole. Now, if you go read about this, you'll still see this called black hole candidate. I do not know a single astronomer who doesn't think this is a black hole. But, you know, we haven't seen the black hole itself, right? You can't see black holes, so we still call it candidate properly. Okay? You guys okay with this? Okay. We see lots and lots of these things in the universe, okay? So there are, uh, in the Milky Way, I actually should have looked up the number. I didn't look up the number. So we have these things called high-mass X-ray binaries. So that's what this is, right? It's high-mass, big things. They're emitting copious amounts of X-rays, and the binary is the two moving around. And we see these all over the Milky Way and in other galaxies, okay? So this isn't the only one. There's lots and lots of them. Okay, center of the Milky Way. So again, this time of year, about... 3 a.m., and the southeast sky moving across the south. You'll see the Milky Way, uh, if you're in a dark enough region, <laughs> tracking across the sky. And right in the middle of the Milky Way is this constellation called Sagittarius, which most of us call the teapot. But Sagittarius is really, does anyone know what it is? The classic figure? It's an archer. I don't understand how a teapot looks like an archer, but it is, okay? But it looks like a teapot. It's got a spout in the top and a handle. There's this little asterism near the side that we usually call the teaspoon, okay? And the Milky Way goes right down over the top of the teaspot. That brightest point in the Milky Way, okay, is the center of the galaxy, and it looks like steam coming out of the teapot, okay? And right where I've marked that circle is the center of the Milky Way. So there's the constellation Sagittarius. You see the bright part, the steam coming out, okay? And if you're out in the dark region, you'll see two bright spots. There's a bright spot up above that's called the Lagoon Nebula, okay? If you look at that through binoculars, it's really uh, bright and easy to see. It's kind of like the Orion Nebula. It's a stellar nursery where there's a new generation of stars being born. But in the country, you can see it with your naked eye, but through binoculars from the city, you certainly still be able to see it. And then down underneath the teapot, there's a bright spot and that's called the Ptolemy Cluster, and that's a cluster of stars that has been born. It's called the Open Cluster. It's called an Open Cluster. And uh, you can also see that through binoculars. It'll look like a smattering of 20 really bright young stars, which is very pretty to look at. But right in the middle between the two of them is the center of the Milky Way. Now, one of the problems we have with the Milky Way galaxy, if you go out here on the wall and look at the glimpse image, so the big image that wraps around in front of cosmology and the, the Bonstell exhibit, that uh, green and yellow and red, that's all dust in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So that's the stuff that stars explode into. It's the stuff that new stars are born out of. But it's between us and the rest of the galaxy. So when we try and look through the Milky Way to the far side of the galaxy, we're looking through all of that stuff. And that's what that glimpse image is showing us. It's showing us all the gas and dust along the Milky Way. And so we're studying it, right? We want to know where did it come from, what's it made of, how are stars born out of it. But one of the difficulties we have is we can't see through it. And so it blocks a lot of our view toward the center of the Milky Way. So if you go to the middle of the glimpse image, right, where it says 0360, and look, I mean, it's just <laughs> stuff all over it, right? If you know where to look, you can see the Lagoon Nebula. There, it's, I think it's on the bottom edge. It's kind of half cut off. And actually, I haven't looked to see if you can see the Ptolemy cluster there. But, but you can recognize stuff in that glimpse image if you know what you're looking for. Okay, but right in the middle there is the center of the Milky Way. So when things are really clogged up with gas and dust, that's what this dark stuff is here. That's that gas and dust from the glimpse image. The only way to see through it is to use light that your eyes can't see. And so we typically look through gas and dust using infrared light, which is light that's below 
the red light that your eye can see. It's very effective, somewhat effective in some cases, for looking through the gas and dust. And so for the last 20 years, we've been watching the center of the Milky Way because we want to know what's going on down there. Okay? Well, this is what we see. Say, for the last 20 years, there's this cluster of stars that we call the S cluster. And this, this particular image is about, uh, what does that say there, 1999. So this is about 10 years old now. Okay? But over the last 20 years, you see we've been seeing stars moving down near the center of the Milky Way. And we have the laws of physics. We can predict the future and explain the things we see. So if you watch this motion, you can work backwards to say what gravity is causing that motion. So let me show you a movie. Okay, so this is the same thing as that image I just showed you. Okay, this is uh, from the uh, Keck Interferometer, which is a big telescope on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Okay, and all of these are the individual stars. And what we've done is we've linked all the observations together to watch a movie. So we're going to play the movie forward, and then we're going to zoom in here on the center. Okay, so let's just watch for a minute. Okay, you see the years roll by up there in the corner. You see all the stars moving? Okay, we're not used to that, right? We're used to the sky being static. But if you watch long enough, and you put it all together, you can see things move. And watch this one. Okay, in the course of about four months, in 2004, I think it was, that star was going one direction on the sky and completely changed the direction that it was traveling. Okay? That doesn't happen very often, right? Stars are big things. Okay? How do you make a star completely change the direction that it's traveling on the sky? Well, it takes really, really strong gravity. And based on the fact that we've seen these orbits that you see us tracing out behind the stars here, I can tell you exactly how much gravity we need. So what do we think? So this is the plot. This is through 2010, I think. Okay, you've seen a lot of these stars now. We've seen complete substantial uh, amounts of their orbits. Okay, so we're physicists. We're like, okay, what are the 25 things that could explain what's going on? Okay, so the obvious one is, well, maybe there's just stars we that that are causing the gravity. It's a whole bunch of stars. It's a really dense part of the galaxy. Maybe the gravity from all of those stars is is causing this. Well, if that were true, in this picture, there should be 90 million stars. If there were 90 million stars in this picture, we could explain everything that we see. But there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's like 20. Okay, so we're missing 89,999,920 stars to explain the gravity that we see down there. Okay, so the only explanation seems to be that it's a 4 million solar mass black hole. We don't see anything at all right there at the middle where all of these things are going around. But if it's a 4 million solar black hole, its gravity is strong enough to create all of this motion that you see, which is kind of cool. Okay? But what happens if you get really close, right? All of these, these are just orbits. These are things going around. It's, you know, black holes pushing things around and making them move. What happens if you get really, really close to a black hole? Because that's where all the crazy stuff that happens goes on, right? Well, if you want to get close to a black hole, you have to have intrepid explorers. You have to have people willing to jump into a black hole. I offer my students to do this all the time. None of them ever do it. Yola looks like she's ready to do it. Okay, but we'll, we'll use these intrepid explorers instead, okay? Okay, so clearly you need space explorers and people who don't know any better, okay? So what happens if you send some intrepid explorers into a black hole? Well, black holes have something called tidal forces. That means if you jump in feet first, your feet are really close to the black hole. And so the gravity at your feet is enormously strong. And so it pulls on your feet really, really hard. But your head is farther away from the black hole. So the gravity is not as strong. It's still being pulled in, but not as strongly as your feet are being pulled. And so the effect of the black hole is to try and stretch you out. So Stephen Hawking calls this spaghettification. I didn't make that up. You look it up on Wikipedia, that totally means it's true, right? Spaghettification, the stretching of you because it's pulling more strongly on one side of you than the other. Okay, now Bert's kind of long to start with, so you can't tell Bert's, but if you were to put the captain in there, the captain would be stretched out into a long piece of spaghetti and it would eventually pull you apart. Everyone asks me, is the science in Interstellar accurate, right? It's accurate all the way up to the point where his spaceship gets destroyed down in the black hole. What destroys his spaceship? His spaceship is getting spaghettified because it's big. 
And so one side of it's being pulled more strongly than the other side, and it rips the spaceship apart. Then all the stuff after that maybe is accurate, it's just crazy stuff. Right? So, we don't have intrepid explorers, but we see things go down into the black hole. And in particular, we see black holes spaghettify stars. So when stars get too close to a black hole, and certainly the stars we see in the Milky Way haven't gotten this close, one side of the star gets pulled on more strongly than the other side, and the black hole rips it apart. And all of that stuff that used to be the star falls down to the black hole. What happens to the gas when it gets close to the black hole? It travels fast. When it travels fast, it gets hot. When it gets hot, it emits x-rays. So if we watch the centers of galaxies like the Milky Way, every now and then we get these bursts of radiation because we think a black hole in the center of the galaxy has torn a star apart. Okay? Before we knew what was going on, we didn't have any idea what these giant bursts were. But we now think it's the tidal disruption of stars by a black hole. Now this is not unique to black holes. Tidal disruption happens all the time. And the most famous example is one that is personal to me because this is why I got into astronomy. In 1992, there was a comet that got too close to Jupiter. We call that comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And Jupiter's gravity did exactly the same thing, right? Comets are basically loose snowballs of rock and dust and ice. But Jupiter's gravity is strong enough, if it pulls strongly on one side of the comet, it's like a slushy snowball. It just collapses. And that comet disintegrated into this very famous picture from Hubble called the String of Pearls. There are like 27 chunks of it. And in 1996, or sorry, 1994, the remnants of that comet slammed into Jupiter and burned holes in the clouds. And you could see this from your backyard with a telescope. I don't know if they did it here at the Adler. Did they watch the impact from the Adler? Does anyone know? Yeah, Larry's probably the only one who's been here. Has anyone been here that long? No? Okay. So anyway, so it's entirely possible uh, that someone here saw it, but I, I certainly was watching it. You, I mean, you could totally see these things, right? If you're used to watching, Jupiter kind of looks white, and you can see the bands, but I mean, it's just black spots on the side of Jupiter, okay? But this is all because of tidal forces, which is exactly what black holes do to stars, which is cool. But this is all black holes doing stuff to other stuff and watching the other stuff. Wouldn't it be better if I could see the black hole itself, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, well, so physicists, actually Einstein's the one who gave us this idea, right? We could see black holes if we could see gravity somehow. Because black holes are pure gravity. There's nothing to a black hole except gravity. And so if you could see gravity somehow, then you could see the black hole itself and not rely on telescopes and eyeballs and things falling into the black hole. So Einstein famously thought of this in 1916, and then he thought he was wrong and wrote another paper in 1930 or something that decided he was wrong, and then he decided he was right. And so this is, this is an issue that has confused physicists for a long time. Okay? But today, we think you can do this. Okay? And the idea is to detect gravity. So this is a picture of the gravity from a binary. Right, like Cygnus X1 or two black holes going around each other is what we ultimately want to talk about. And because gravity can't travel faster than the speed of light, if you're standing out here trying to measure the gravity of that binary, as those stars move around, the gravity changes. But it takes time for that information to get out to you. The gravity gets stronger when the things are closer from you, it gets weaker when they're farther away, and they get stronger, and they get weaker, and they get stronger. And that information has to travel through the universe at the speed of light or less. So we call these gravitational waves. And the waves are that undulating change in the gravity that maybe you could detect if you had the wherewithal to do it, if you had the technology. And Einstein famously thought this would be impossible. The effects are extremely tiny. He didn't think we'd ever have the technology, but you and I live in the future. We have superconductors and lasers and giant computers, and we can totally do this. And we are doing this. So, if you want to detect them, what do you do? You watch little tiny changes in distance in space-time. Because that's what gravity does. It's stretching space and time between me and you, and me and you, and you and you, and me and you. It's just constantly changing, stretching that space-time. And if I could detect it, then I could detect gravity. If I can detect gravity, I can look for black holes directly. So we're doing this. 
So this is most famously embodied here in the United States by an experiment called LIGO. Okay, there are two LIGO detectors. There's one in Hanford, Washington. Okay, and there's one in Livingston, Louisiana. Anyone here from Washington? Anyone from Louisiana? Okay, well you can go visit them. Uh, they're in quite different places. It's very deserty in eastern Washington. My, my folks live about an hour south of here. Uh, this one's in Livingston, Louisiana. It's much lusher. We have different kinds of problems, right? This is on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. So the tumbleweeds that blow up against the building are radioactive. You, you have to take care of them. And here, you know, there's alligators living in the trenches here. So we only send undergraduates out to check the interferometer. Um, so, okay. But inside, it looks like the Death Star laser, right? <laughs> we got gigantic lasers. And we send lasers up and down these arms of these uh, interferometers. They're four kilometers from the center building to the end station. And the laser light flies back and forth. And we time how long that takes to happen. And if gravity's passing between this building and here and changing the space-time distance, it takes the laser a little longer to get down there and come back to me. And I can sense that. If I can sense that, I can tell you about the black hole that caused that change in gravity. So, here's some pictures from the inside. This is me uh, inside that corner building. So you can see how big the lasers are all inside these giant vacuum tubes. We have jillions of computers hooked up to them, right? big spaghetti nest of, of, of wires. Okay, these are some pictures of the, this is looking down the bean tube. Uh, this is one of the expansion joints. You can see it right there behind me. I'm standing up on a overlook looking down on it, right? So when they build this thing, it's four kilometers long. You don't quite get it the exact right length. So this, this joint right here is the last piece they put in and they put this big forklift and they pinch it and they squeeze this baffle together and they drop it in, they let it go and it expands, right? Because building something this enormous is really, really hard. Right. So I love crawling. I mean, I don't do this sort of stuff, right? So this stuff amazing. I love crawling around. It's like, who decided we needed a bolt there, right? Who decided we needed, you know, this built just like this? It's just amazing to me. All the moving parts. It's like building giant rockets, right? It's exceedingly complicated. But in the end, we can detect the gravity from two black holes crashing into each other. So the last thing I want to do today is I want to show you that, and then we'll call it a day. So this is the kind of thing that we typically see in our data. Okay. So these, as physicists, if we saw this, we'd be really, really excited. But of course, all of us are used to looking at Hubble images, right? So if I send this to the editor at the New York Times, he's like, go away, kid, you bother me, right? How can I make this exciting, right? And the way we make it exciting is we can turn all this data into sound. So rather than using your eyes, you can listen to this data. You can hear what the black hole's gravity sounds like. So I'm gonna play two sounds for you and then we'll be done. So I'm gonna play two sounds and I'm gonna play two of them because they're exactly the same thing. It's a 10 solar mass black hole, so it's a little bit lighter than that one Cygnus X1, falling into a 10,000 solar mass black hole. So one that's not quite as big as the one at the center of the galaxy, but still a big one, okay? And the difference between the two sounds I'm gonna play for you is one of them is just circular orbits. And then the second one is exactly the same two black holes, but they're on elliptical, oval-shaped orbits. Okay, and so what I like about the sounds is you can hear the difference. Okay, and I could do this with anything. I could change the mass, and you'd be able to hear the difference. I could change how the black holes are spinning, and you could hear the difference. I could change whether or not the orbit's like this or the orbit's like this, and you could hear the difference. Right? All of that information is encoded in the gravity that you get from these systems. And so we're just figuring out how to do this. So this is two examples. Okay, so I'm going to play the first one. Okay, <laughs> isn't that cool? So we call that the chirp. So what's happening, right? So when the black holes start going around each other, that's the first sound you have. But over time, these gravitational waves take energy out of the system, and they get closer and closer together. And as orbits get smaller, you go faster. So you hear the pitch going up okay, to higher frequencies, to shorter strings on the piano. But then it's getting louder. And the reason it's getting louder is because when you get closer and closer together, the gravity gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And this signal is the signal of the gravity. So you hear that, that loudness is the gravity getting stronger. Okay, 
Here's the second one. So you get the chirp again, so what's going on, right? In the beginning, you hear those pops, right? But we said they're on oval-shaped orbits. So when they're far away, is the gravity weak or strong? It's weak, so there's almost no sound. That's the quiet part. And then when they get close together, the gravity's really strong, and that's when you hear it pop. Pop, pop, pop. And over time, the gravity takes energy, but it also takes what physicists call angular momentum away. It makes the orbit more circular, so it starts to sound more and more like the old one. So at the moment when it finally merges, it's almost circular. All of that information is in those waves. And in the next two or three years, we're going to detect these things all the time with instruments like LIGO. At least one a month, which is kind of cool. So this is all I want to say, right? So this is, this is, this is really way out on the bleeding edge of science, right? Einstein figured out relativity and, you know, Mitchell proposed black holes 200 years ago. But it's just today that we even are getting to the point where we understand even just a little bit so that we can actually go look for these things, which is kind of cool, okay? But science is always changing. That's just the way it works. And it's something we got to get used to. Relativity, as I said, is a year, uh, century old. Uh, but uh, it takes time to understand all these things. So even though it was a hundred years old, it's just today that we know how to use this stuff to understand the universe, but also to change our everyday lives, right? So the GPS is a good example of that. And then this is what I do, right? This is trying to understand how to see the universe um, with uh, gravity instead of light. So that's what I do every day. When you all see me walking around with my hair sticking straight up and ink stains on my shirt from my pen, and you know, that's what I've been doing all day is <laughs> trying to figure this stuff out. So, um, If you're interested, here's a few books you can go read. Uh, black Holes and Time Warts by Kip is uh, probably one of the best ones if you just really are interested in black holes and stuff. Uh, Marsha Bartusiak wrote this very nice book. She won Both these books won awards. Uh, this is about gravitational waves. Uh, and then this, if you want to diddle around with some math. If you can do algebra and like doing algebra, this will let you do some calculations. They'll help you understand uh, astrophysical black holes and stuff like that. Um, I have a blog where I've been writing about relativity and gravity for the last 10 weeks or so. Um, I write about a lot of other things, but I've just been writing about gravity for the centennial, so you can go there. And then if you go here, um, I've been making these little three minute videos about uh, relativity. So there's a series of like 10 of them that you can watch and they'll just kind of go through the whole relativity story from start to end. So, so I've about three more of these to do, and then I'll be done with this whole series. But you can, you can start watching them now if you want to read more. So, okay, so it's 11 o'clock, and I'm done. I'm happy to answer questions, but I know some of you probably have places you got to be and things you got to do. So uh, thanks for coming, and we'll do this a few more times, right?